The Psalms are man's words to God that have become God's words to man. They give us the language to pray through any experience. The goal in this series is to learn more of the language of prayer to help us tell our story to God when we pray. Happy Father's Day. So fathers, let's give you a round of applause. Glad you're here today. We have a gift for you, and on the way out, we have uh, two of our lovely students. We'll be handing that out, so as you exit the door, you'll uh, receive a, a, a parting gift, if you will. I hope we, you don't depart, but um, yeah, we just want to celebrate that fact, and there's sort of this little tension between the kind of gifts we give on Father's Day and the ones we give on Mother's Day, and so it's, I can tell you staff meetings are, are kind of, yeah, kind of tough to work through that conversation, but... <laughs> Anyway, hey, we're in this second part of the series in Psalms where we are learning the language of prayer by looking at how people prayed uh, in the Psalms. And it's rich, it's full, it's a good series for the summer when you have maybe a little bit of extra time where you can spend some time in prayer. And so on the front of your bulletin guide, uh, there is an explanation of what we hope that you will attempt to do each week. There's a psalm to read in the morning, a psalm to read in the evening, and then four questions that help you dig a little deeper into the content. And then we're hoping that you will use that psalm as your prayer or part of that psalm as your prayer, and you will learn a prayer language that is divine, one that will help you get out that stuff inside you that you have such a hard time talking about, maybe to God. And so it gets you out of the rut of prayer that you might find yourself in at times. And it'll also make your life rich uh, and full as you pray God's word to him. And so we just hope that you get involved in that. So uh, today we're going to be talking about how we pray through our real moments of failure. Now, I didn't necessarily pick this sermon on Father's Day but uh, it's certainly one I wouldn't present on Mother's Day, right? So, because, uh, you know, I can just speak to the guys maybe sometimes a little bit this morning. But, but we have these moments of failure that it's really hard to work through sometimes. Like, we, we don't really want to talk about it. And so, um, how can our confession of failure result in joy? Like, how, when we talk about, when we try to get out what we've done wrong, where we have been and what's been messed up in our life, how do we pray through that without it, you know, resulting in just further condemnation and burying ourselves in self-pity? Um, when, you, when I say the word confession, all right, what emoji pops up in your mind? Is it a smiley face or is it a sad face, right? Uh, sad face, show of hands, all right, confession, smiley face, one, maybe, all right, somebody's done some hard work, all right, so um, imagine looking at our confessions before the Lord and for those who we need to confess to, imagine that confession becoming a moment of joy and celebration, like, because that's what we're going to read about today, like, this is what God's work does in us, it transforms that which is destructive and harmful and renews it in a new frame with God's spirit and his blessing to, to, to something beautiful. And so it, it seems ridiculous that, uh, that we would talk about confession in this kind of light because normally we try to hide everything wrong in our life, don't we? Right? So if there's something that we're not getting right or something we've messed up, we usually try to bury that. We put that back in the closet. We, we cover that up. We spend our lives, most of our lives, for usually a big part until we meet Jesus, of hiding what has went wrong in our life. I love it to see someone work through that and make a public confession of where they've been. And, and it's not, it's, they're not like... Uh, celebrating how terrible they were. They're simply talking about how God delivered them and they no longer carry shame and guilt. Woo! That's cool when you don't have to walk around with that weight. And, and so this is what we're talking about. Like confession through the transformation of the Holy Spirit, through God's word, can become something of joy. I guarantee, I promise it. But God promises it in a scripture. And so... Um, we're going to be looking at Psalms 32 today. It's one of the uh, penitential psalms. Penance meaning, you know, uh, 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 working through uh, restitution in your life, uh, working through uh, the process of, 
uh, of, of what you owe to someone or something, right? You know, and so there's six in the book of Psalms. We're going to be looking at Psalms 32. Maybe the most famous is Psalms 51, and you can maybe look that up uh, this week. But the background of the psalm is, is probably pretty well known if you've been to church much at all. Uh, King David had uh, an adulterous relationship with Bathsheba and uh, conspired a plot to kill her husband Uriah. And so, uh, so what we're saying here is that this confession is, you know, he didn't just take a candy bar from 7-Eleven. No, this, this, is, this is a heinous crime. This changed multiple families' lives. It, 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 it rocked his kingdom. It would end up being one of the biggest things, consequences he would have to work through later in life, like we talked about last week in Psalm 3. So this is an epic sin. And David's going to show us, or the Lord's going to show us through David's life, how confession can go from just the most grievous moment in your life to something of great joy and and so uh, let's get started. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one. I want to stop right here in the psalm and just talk a little bit about blessed. It's a word that we don't use much. I mean, I don't, sometimes you use it at church. I'm blessed. No, you don't say that. I mean, we don't normally say blessed, right? We might say bless your heart. And that in the South, that usually means, well, you know what that means. And... <laughs> And so the word blessed really doesn't have much of an understanding uh, in our culture, but we might call it the good life, all right? So when we think of the good life in worldly terms, it's usually a guy, he's holding a can of Bud Dumber with some scantily clad women, right? And he's on the beach somewhere. I, I mean, it's not my good life, but your good life might be a beach house, it might be a mountain cabin, it might be, you know, traveling around the world. The good life, the good life, picture your dream life. David says, the one who has the good life, their transgressions are forgiven. The picture of the good life in Psalms 32 is one person, a person who knows they're deeply flawed and broken. Second, they know they need forgiveness. And third, they know they have forgiveness. Blessed is that person. And so I think probably the listeners in this group, the listeners who are watching online or probably, you know, listen to this at some point, there, there, there are three groups of people. There are those groups of people that recognize they're deeply flawed and they need forgiveness and they found it, right? That'd be group one. That's the group we all want to be part of, right? There's a second group and they see the good life as being morally good, right? If I just do good, God will love me and so will others. I just have to perform well, right? That's, that's the second group. And then there's the third group and they can't see past their sins, their guilt and their shame are before them every time they shave or, you know, walk. You know, I mean, all, they see it. They, they can see inside. That's all they can see. And they walk around muttering about their sins. And so here's what we're trying to do. We're trying to discover the good life. And this psalm will help us find that. All right, so let's continue reading. Uh, or actually, I need to make this point. The blessed good life described in Psalms 32 is a person who has recognized they're deeply flawed, they need forgiveness, and they have confidently found that. And so this is what we're going to be trying to get to. Uh, blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them and in whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent, David says, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long, for day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let all the faithful pray to you while they may be found. Surely the rising of the mighty waters will not reach them. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. Do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, but must be controlled by bit and bridle, or they will not come to you. Many are the woes of the wicked, wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the one who trusts in him. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing, 
all you who are upright in heart. This is God's word. And so first we just want to look at the toxic reality of sin that David describes, right? David looks at three aspects of sin here, three different words in the Hebrew. The first one is kataha, which is a moral failure. The second one, iniquity that he talks about. This is in Psalms 32, verse 5. And then awan or avan, some pronounce it, is going astray. And transgressions, pasha, is rebellious self-assertion. So there, David, what he does is he shows the, the, this, that sin has multiple um, uh, presentation in our life. Right? So there's, a, there's the one where we just make a huge mistake, like David sinned with Bathsheba. There's the one where you're, you're kind of ignorant of what you should be doing, and you just kind of wander off into, uh, uh, into trouble. And then there's the high-handed sin. Now, I can tell you that I've done all three. I, I've been, you know, I, I've, I've had moral failures. I, I've just not known the way to go and not had wisdom and not, not, not listened to the mentoring or coaching that was around me. Nobody's speaking in my life. And then there's that high-handed sin. This is what I'm going to do. This is what I want, right? And the reason we sin is we want the good life. But it never brings a good life. It never brings a blessed life, right? Now, when our culture talks about sin... They talk about it um, almost in a comic way. You know, like, you know, this chocolate is sinfully delicious, right? Right? Or this, you know, it, you know, so we almost, we make almost a joke out of sin in our culture today through different advertisement. But, but um, maybe the greatest sin in our culture, and I don't know, this is, I didn't get research on this, but I'm just guessing. Maybe the greatest sin in our culture is this. Telling someone that the actions that they're participating in are sinful and wrong. That's probably the number one sin. It's like calling out sin that's sin, right? Like don't, you know, don't judge. Don't judge. Don't, don't, don't determine anyone's behavior is right or wrong. Like that's totally up to them. Like this is a, this is a moment in history that's very unique in the world history. Like that we... That we don't see a, there's a there's an absolute standard of right and wrong like that's just been tossed to the curb like we're the first generation that I that I can think of in modern history that's like actually done that for because most most of world history is like there was some standard that everyone would abide by and somehow in our culture it's like you get to choose you get to choose you know what marriage is what life is what you know whatever it is you, know, you just you just make it up as you go along and so maybe one of the greatest sins in our culture is like saying there is an absolute standard of right and wrong and and, and, and so so anyway um maybe the hardest step for most of us is admitting that we're wrong going to get a witness all right <laughs> like i was wrong we i think my kids say that right I, they hated it. I would say, now you tell your sister I was wrong and you were right. And they just, you know, I forced it. And uh, anyway, they, my wife's a counselor, so she's taking care of all that with them. But, but anyway, you know, I mean, it's really hard to admit you're wrong. It's so hard. And, and it's hard to let someone tell us what to do. Like, we, we, we don't want anyone to tell us what to do. Don't you tell me that. I'll make my own choice. You know, we buck all up and all that. And so, so anyway, um, the, like the sin of lying, for example. The sin of lying. Lying is, it, 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 it's, it's, it's something we do for our own gain. And when we lie, and because this is something that maybe most of us have done. I, I'm, probably all of us at some point in time when we're young or Whenever he lied about something, what we're doing is we're we're telling a falsehood that is trying to gain some advantage in the situation over a person. It can dehumanize people, right? It can really reduce people to objects that you're trying to control. And so when we think about, let's just, for example, the sin of lying, when we think about that, it's toxic. It's it begins to eat away at not only who you are, but how you think about the rest of humanity. And, and, and the reality of sin is, is that it destroys. And so, unconfessed sin destroys. Do I, I hardly need to validate this. Do I? I mean, 
all of us immediately have some story in mind, maybe in your own life, maybe someone famous who, who sinned about a lot of stuff and it's just wrecked their life, it's wrecked a business, it's wrecked a, you know, a nation maybe. I mean, it, I hardly need to validate the point that, that unconfessed sin destroys. It, it begins to just eat away at us and when it finally comes out, the damage is so horrific. Now, as I said before, we live in a culture that's rejected an absolute moral truth, right? There's a, there, there's a rejection of what God's word says about what is right and what is wrong. A culture, a person, a family, a, whatever, they can reject there's an absolute standard. They can say, I'm going to come up with my own. But here's, here's something that's very important. We are hardwired to this truth. God made us. A person may reject the truth, but they cannot stop the decay inside of them. It is impossible. You cannot stop the effect of sin within you. You can deny that, but we cannot stop its decay. A rejection of God's moral absolutes does not remove the internal consequence. I'm telling you, I, when I was thinking about this throughout this week, this is, this is, you need to think deeply about this. There are people that say this is what sexuality is, this is what marriage is, this is what, this is what good behavior is, this is what bad behavior is. They, they can declare these things opposite to what God has said, but they cannot undo the damage it does within them when they participate in it. It is impossible. There's no counseling. There's no medication. By the way, one of the things I think that's happening in our culture is that there's so much unconfessed sin, unrecognized sin, it's internally destroying people, and they're trying to figure out ways to deal with it when the only way they really can deal with it is confession and God's grace. I'm, I'm just saying that... I mean, I'm not putting, I, you know, I, I'm, I, like I said, I'm married to a counselor. I hear all the talk. I, I understand the medication. I'm not saying that's bad. I'm just saying that if you're not dealing with a heart issue, you're always going to have the effects of that unconfessed sin in your life. It cannot escape it. So anyway, what Adam and Eve do when they sinned? They hid. What Cain do when he saw his brother was one up on him? He got angry. What did Peter do when he betrayed the Lord? Right? He ran away in shame. There's no way that we get away from the effect of sin unless we confess and fall on God's grace. So confession, you see, is getting out what's toxic inside you and if you refuse to confess the toxicity remains the poison remains it, it, you have to this is the only way to get out what is destroying us and that is to confess to the lord and maybe to someone that you need to express this to you know and so it's very important Real confession requires submission to the Lord. So there's a worthless confession. There's a, a worthless confession that um, drowns itself in self-pity, right? Like they're just like, I, I am, I, you know, I just, really, I just really messed up. And, and you know, and I, I didn't know what I was doing. And I mean, it just, you know, it's a family tradition and blah, 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 blah. blah. Like, that's not confession, not, not the confession we're talking. I mean, it may be a confession, but it won't result in the blessed life. It won't result in the good life. And then there's that confession, right? There's that confession that, that's sort of like, you know, it's an admittance, but it's an appoint to some other circumstances that, you know, well, you know, I know I did it, but, uh, well, you know, you wouldn't believe what they did to me. Okay, that's a confession that does not lead into the good life. Real confession is, I did it, my fault, I sinned. 
that's real confession. And that's what, that's what, that's what David does, right? And so David gives us this little mini parable in Psalm 32. He says, this is the message translation. L- let me give you some good advice. I'm looking you in the eye and giving it to you straight. Sounds like. This is John Wayne. How do I do it in a John Wayne voice? Let's back up a minute. All right, partner. Let me give you some good advice. That's not even John Wayne. All right, I won't even try. No, nah, yeah, I'll just, just read the Bible, Bob. Uh, <laughs> don't be like an ornery, don't be ornery like a horse or a mule that needs a bit and bridle to stay on track. It's a mini parable. Like, it's an illustration. Like, Jesus would give one. Like, David sticks one in there. Because he's saying that this is the type of confession that you need to have. Because this confession requires submission to the Lord. And so imagine. Imagine a rider on the mule. You're going down the Grand Canyon. You're on the south rim. There's all these mules. And they, they take people down to the bottom of the canyon. And they go some really narrow passes. But say you have an honor mule. And... Uh, Stay to the right is the state of the canyon wall. To go to the left is to go off of some cliff to your death. And you're on this ornery mule, right? And, uh, and you're pulling back on the reins because this ornery mule wants to go left and you want to go right because you want to live, right? And so what do you do? You pull the bridle up. It inflicts pain. The mule doesn't like it. it wants pleasure. doesn't want pain. So it finally comes back. But then you let up a little bit and it keeps going over that way. And you pull back. Because you want to go right and it wants to go left. Don't be like that, David says. Don't make God constantly be pulling back on the rain, disciplining your life to keep you from dying or blowing up your life. Submit to his word. What he says, do. That's what what David is saying. And, And so... True confession, a true confession, will lead to a new walk, a new journey, a new path. Real confession shows like an outcome that you're going a different direction. This was headed to death. God pulled back on the reins. I get it. Don't like the pain. Now I'm going this way. And God will do that over and over again. And there's some... Teaching from Paul in Thessalonians where he says there, there is a comes point in time where God like, all right, you want to walk off the cliff? Go. And so we have free will. Now, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven and whose sin is covered, right? This is what David said. It's really interesting that David uses the word covered here. And uh, <clears throat> because as I said at the beginning... We work so hard to cover up our sin, hide it, conceal it, don't want to talk about it, keep it away. Let's not, you know, I've already talked about, can we, do we have to talk about it? Yeah. So, I mean, we try so hard. And, and, and so David says, blessed is one whose sin is covered. Now, Paul, the apostle Paul, he was a, he, he was a convert to Jesus. So if you're not familiar with who Paul is, but he wrote the book of Romans. And in Romans chapter four, he quotes this very psalm. He talks about confession he talks about our sins being covered and he talks about it in light of the work of christ right talks about what jesus has done and so what what paul is saying is that that jesus covered our sin but jesus himself was uncovered the reason jesus didn't die by lethal injection or or electric chair i know they weren't invented all that but i'm just saying like the reason that jesus the reason that God brought this forefront to the Roman minds about crucifixion was that it's the most humili- humiliating way you could possibly think to die. I know, we see the pictures, Jesus on the cross, and he's got that little apron over his genitals, but that's not what it was. He's absolutely naked to all for hours, exposed. Jesus was uncovered. So that we could be covered. It's really important that we get this. Because um, our sin. We're trying to cover it up. And you can't. right? It's going to come out. And, 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 and then sometimes we do something wrong. We don't, we don't bring it to light. Because we'll just try to do a lot more good stuff. And that will take care of it. No. 
No, now, now your forgiveness is based on what you can do, and, and that's not going to work. And so Jesus uncovers himself to cover us. 1 John 1, 9, if you confess your sin, God is what? Faithful. He's faithful and just to forgive us. And so here's the point. The basis of Christian confession is what Jesus has done. Paul says in another one of his letters, For God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for sin so that we might be right, made right with God through Christ. The basis of Christian confession is the work of Christ on the cross. This is Now, David was looking to the cross. We're looking back, right? <clears throat> David is... Is, is anticipating there'll be there'll come a sacrifice that will take care of it all we're looking back and going now that sacrifice jesus is ultimate we get it he has taken care of all of that but our basis of our confession is not how good you say it it's not how bad you beat yourself up i'm going to give a word to somebody in here because it's coming to me too all right let me give you a word stop beating yourself up for where you have failed it will not help. It will only make you feel worse. The beating you, gave, you give yourself every day is not, doesn't even compare to the ripping of Christ's flesh off his body. The beating is much worse. He's taken care of it. Stop beating yourself up for where you fail. And be like David who committed adultery, murder, and brought a kingdom down and said, I'm forgiven, I'm covered, blessed is me, blessed is the one. Like, isn't that amazing? Like, how can it be? It can be because our basis of forgiveness, what makes confession so real is that it's the work of Jesus. Christ's blood cleanses us from all all unrighteousness. That is amazing. Thank you for joining us. You can find us on the web at cornerstonechatham.org.